Today, Richard Moore will be facilitating this panel discussion. So please help me welcome Richard Moore. Thank you, Mary Ellen. And uh, thanks to everybody for, for coming today. Um, I think we're still bringing in chairs. So uh, uh, we've got a, a good audience here today. Um, and we've really been looking forward to this session today. Uh, there are some conversations involving student success uh, in Texas and across the country. Uh, and they often happen in little uh, pockets where people who are working on similar issues are, are talking with each other. But having the broad conversation involving uh, faculty, administrators, uh, policy makers, um, uh, philanthropists, all in one room to share the conversation seemed like there would be tremendous value uh, in having this experience. So um, what we'll do today is start the conversation with our panelists here today. I'll introduce them in just a moment. And then we'll open it up for a uh, conversation with the audience. So if you have questions or thoughts you'd like to share, uh, we'll bring you into the discussion uh, as well so we can uh, get the faculty uh, perspective, uh, make sure that it's included in, in what we're uh, considering today. Today we have with us, I'm, I'm really honored to have uh, y'all with us today to be with us to talk about these issues from your point of view. We try to get as many different points of view uh, here together uh, uh, for this. Uh, with us today is Steve Head, the Chancellor of the Lone Star College System. Paul Markham, Policy... Thank you. Paul Markham is Program Officer for Post-Secondary Success for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, next to the end down there. Next to Paul is Melissa Henderson. Uh, she is Post-Secondary Policy Analyst at Educate Texas uh, in Austin. Steve Johnson is with TACC, their Vice President of Public Affairs, and he works a lot on the legislative efforts, uh, their efforts in Austin at the Capitol. Gail Malone is the Director of Teaching and Learning Center and the Chair of the Education Department at South Plains College and a former President of TCCTA. And our current President this year, David Leidick, uh, is an English faculty member at Austin Community College. Thank you all for being with us today. So we've been uh, having conversations, mostly by email, because everybody's so busy uh, this time of year, uh, talking about how do we frame this in a way that we can all engage in. And uh, uh, it's difficult, I think, because we're each dealing with a piece of it. And I think everybody wishes that everybody else knew something that you know. So I wanted to give each of you an opportunity, starting out, uh, just to share. If there were one thing that you could, that you wish everybody knew uh, about your role in student success, the insights that you have on it, what would that be? Uh, Melissa, why don't you start? Uh, what do you see in, uh, in the student success <laughs> issue that you wish everyone knew? Thanks, Richard. <laughs> So we convene a group called the Texas Student Success Council, which is a policy and advocacy focused group made up of stakeholders from K-12, higher ed, business, philanthropy, community organizations from across the state. Uh, we are thrilled to have both Richard and David serving on the council and Steve, uh, Steve Head and uh, Ray Garcia from TACC. Um, and we're focused on student success issues, particularly through a community college lens. And we also have the chairs of the House and Senate Higher Education Committee serving as ex officios as well as Commissioner Paredes and Chairman Alcantar from the Workforce Commission. And um, we really try hard to bring together all variety of perspectives. And it has been invaluable to have that faculty voice be a piece of that conversation. And we focus on a, a number of different priorities. Um, and I think, you know, it really, for us, it really is about, we know in bringing together folks as diverse as, you know, faculty and students and administrators and philanthropy and business that we're going to have a lot of areas where we disagree but there's a lot of areas where we do agree and it's about finding those areas and building consensus from there um, and making sure that all voices are represented to the benefit of students thank you Paul Great. thanks Richard so uh, again I'm Paul Markham from the Bill among the Gates Foundation I work on higher ed uh, things of all sorts for the foundation so I've suspect I'll elaborate on this as we go along, but if this one key message that, um, that I see, because you know, I actually come from the faculty. I've spent a number of years teaching and I uh, worked at different levels and now from the foundation there's sort of this hundred thousand foot view of education, you know, uh, 
uh, nationally. And my, the one thing to say that I suspect you certainly feel, especially faculty, is that the, the world is changing in dramatic ways and, and higher education is being pulled along with it. Technologies are changing. Even, even the science of teaching and learning is changing dramatically. Uh, you know, this very, in, you know, ode to community colleges, our, our access agenda has been somewhat successful. I mean, enormously successful because we now have uh, diversity and, uh, and, and, you know, and open doors, you know, for, for students who are seeking education. But the challenges, of course, as you might know, are things like developmental education. You know, there's, there's, uh, it's a challenge for all of you. It's a challenge for us. We think a lot about that at the foundation. That's quite honestly where I spend most of my time is uh, I, I have the remediation portfolio at, at Gate. So I think a lot about that. But I'm, And I'll I think I'll have some opportunities to elaborate, but the world is changing, and, and quite honestly, you faculty are at the center of that. Well, first of all, thanks for, for having me. Um, I'm telling you, I'm happy to be here instead of in Austin, which I'm normally on on a Friday afternoon. Um, I'm Steve Johnson. I'm with uh, TACC. Um, you know, when I think about when the one thing I could tell you that, that, that I'd like for you to know that, that I deal with in my world, and it's, it's especially pronounced this legislative session is we have a real opportunity with the new crop of legislators that we have. Um, you know, in the legislature, particularly in the House side, you've got two-thirds of the membership that's in their freshman or their sophomore terms. What that means for us is there's a whole lot of educating that needs to go on. Um, there is not a member of the legislature, well, there's a couple House members that don't have community colleges in their district. For the most part, everybody has a community college district, and they all love their local community college. The disconnect is many of them don't know what it is you do, and they don't know they don't know the important role that you play, uh, the current status of Texas, but Texas moving forward. And many of them, and I'm sure you know this, when they think of higher education experience, they think of their own, and typically that was being 18 year old, 18 years old, and going to A&M College Station or Stephen F. Austin, wherever it may be. Um, so a lot of my job this session. Melissa's as well, and, and others, is to try to have them understand, to tell the story of what community colleges do, how they're going to be the drivers of, of Texas moving forward. And so I know we're going to have a chance to talk a lot about different policy areas, um, but I kind of wanted to, to leave you with that, that we've got some real opportunities uh, this time around. Thank you. The people that clapped out there were, uh, there's about 20 or 25 people here, I think, from Lone Star, so that's who was uh, clapping. So. <laughs> I had to alter all of my, uh, uh, what I was going to say. Now that I know you guys are here, I'm going to change everything to fit with what I've been. Well, no, for me, the, uh, uh, you know, when I, take a, when I think about student success, I was at an HED meeting. I just came back from it. But it's, it is about uh, social justice and equality to me. That's, that's ultimately why you're here. That's why you teach. That's why we here, we're here. So, you know, if you want to take a broader view of this, and uh, I, I just think that, the roles that we have, whether your faculty or your staff or administration, you have the opportunity to change people's lives in a, in a way that other people do not. And I think that's very important that we keep that in mind. You know, with that, though, comes um, accessibility. I think all of us are in this job because we want to make the world a better place. It's just, it's just not complicated. So how you do that is a different issue. So it's about accessibility. It's about helping students navigate through a system that is very complicated to them. It's complicated to those of us who work there. I mean, you know that. Sometimes you don't know who's doing what. I found out the higher I go, the less likely I know what somebody's actually doing. I know what's on paper. I just don't know what they're doing. But, and I, I would, uh, ultimately, our job is to help them reach their goal, whatever that may be in the completion piece, whether that be going into a job in workforce or going on to the university. We, we want to prepare them for life. And I'm not talking about just in the academic sense. Student success is also about how we uh, how we work with the entire student, how to dress, how to show up on time, how to turn your work in on time. If you're gonna, they, they've heard my stories before. I've got four children. I've been through this before. My son told me in his junior year, he finally figured out that if he went to class, he could make a good grade. I'm going, well, gee, son, that's not. So, you know, that student success piece for all of us, we're all involved in this, and it really is a higher, loftier goal to me, I think, than just worrying about how well somebody did in the English or history and what the grades were. So, 
Um, so the question is, what do I wish everybody knew about student success from my perspective? Well, what I wish everybody knew was what everybody in this room already knows, that the heart of it is and will always be us in the classroom with those students, us in the office with those students. Then it comes down to our caring about them, our uh, connecting with them. If you heard the panel of students talking last night at the general session, for example, that's what it comes down to. Um, it comes down to our having the ability to be understanding, but to maintain our standards. Um, we have to be able to um, uphold academic integrity without somebody telling us, you need to pass these students if we don't think they need to be passed. But it all comes down to us in the classroom with the students. That's the heart of student success. And no matter what else is flying around us at our colleges or at the legislative level, level uh, that's what I would like everybody to be reminded of. My name is Gail Malone, and I'm at South Point College. And when uh, Dr. Becky Tate and I finished our master's degree at Texas Tech University, I had never heard of a even know what it was. And yet I've spent the last 35 years of my life at a Texas Community College. Of course, uh, she and I were both just small children when we got our master's degrees. And uh, all this time I've been involved in student success and developmental education. And I think all of you who are involved in developmental education, and from my perspective, all of you who teach in the community college are involved in developmental you change people's lives. It's just an undeniable fact that you do that. And so my greatest joy is when a student comes up to me and says, because of this class, my life is different now. You have changed my life for me. And the fact is that student changed his or her life, that we could share some tools with them that allowed them and enabled them to do that. And I just want to thank all of you for the role you play in changing students' lives. And whenever you get discouraged, you know, keep a little file of all those emails you receive, all those texts that you receive, all those notes that you receive, and just get out some of those and remind yourself of how many lives are different today because of what you did as a teacher. We only get good ones, don't we? We delete the levels. Well, thank you all for it. I mean, you all are coming at this from such different points of view, but I think you, you're all having an insight on, on a valuable insight on, on all this. Um, I'd like to start some of this conversation about uh, with some successes. What are some things that you all are finding that has worked uh, in your context? And uh, Steve, ahead, if you wouldn't mind, we've got two Steves on the panel, so we'll have to uh, be clear. Um, at Lone Star, uh, do you have something that, comes to mind for you uh, that y'all have done that really seems to have had an impact on students that they've been more successful because of Yeah, that. just to, just from the broader standpoint, we uh, we have something called uh, LSC completes or success, depending on what day it is and who gives me the report. But so we we've worked uh, we put a plan together with concrete actions in there, and I think that's the key. And we also involved faculty from the beginning. Well, let me rephrase that. Because I'm looking at them, we we got faculty in there shortly after we started because we realized it, it can't be successful without without faculty. But we had some concrete successes. I think we decided to uh, when we look at barriers, we decided that uh, orientation was one of them. And you think, well, maybe we don't need to be doing that, but or make it mandatory. But we think orientation, a mandatory orientation class, is very important. We also uh, began a uh, student success course. That's mandatory also. That's a three-hour credit class. And so I think those two, to get students off to the right start, in the student success course, for example, they, uh, they have to choose a major. They, there's a curriculum. They go through a career advising piece where they explore opportunities. They learn time management, uh, how to deal with uh, like crisis management and the issues in their lives. So I think those two issues, we have a plan. Things like continuous remediation and uh, early alert and all that, but those two, I think, have made the difference in the way students get started with us. 
So you're still really seeing some results. Yes, we are. And I think a lot of our schools have things like that that they're doing, and, and we're beginning to see uh, the ones that really make a difference and, and what it is about them that makes them work. Yeah, the one thing I, I will say, though, is that none of those are going to be successful. I'm really clear about the role of faculty in this. Nothing works without the faculty participating in the discussion. We just These are not bureaucratic issues. I told the group in there, by the way, we had a little pre-meeting before this. If you're wondering what administrators are doing sometimes, you probably shouldn't be wondering, but they probably don't know what they're doing. So you just need to keep that in mind. When you're engaging in the conversation, I'm not sure they know any more than you do. So so we're all figuring this, this out as we go. Well, yeah. I mean, it's we're all kind of in this together and learning together uh, about what we should, what works and what doesn't work. And I, I think keeping an open mind, though, about what you can try and just try things and see whether they work or not. So at the institutional level, you're finding some, some things that seem to have some traction and are making a difference. At a, at a higher policy level, um, uh, Paul, uh, are you finding that there's some initiatives in Texas or around the country that seem um, to have promise, that the things that your foundation has identified uh, particularly to be effective? Yes, and I like, there's, there's many, actually. And, uh, a few on the policy front that I'll hold for policy experts. Uh, in terms of interventions, I mean, things that touch the curriculum and touch your classroom, I'll just mention two. It's quite promising. And this is, because I'm, I'm curious how many, how many of you have heard of Quantway Statway? In your, you have those in your, oh, okay. Uh, Quantway and Statway, right? And, uh, and there might be, uh, here you might hear of new mathways. That might be much more familiar to you. And Quantway Statway is just one instance of uh, the work that comes out of UT Austin uh, for an alternative math pathway. And what, what we've seen, we've in, invested in a number of these, uh, these pathways that, uh, as you might know, students uh, show up quite unprepared for, for the mathematics they need in any number of, of avenues, whether they want to be uh, you know, a, a STEM major somewhere, or, or they simply need to get through the math course that they have to, to get through to move on. And uh, we have, uh, we've seen very robust results from, in the case of, uh, uh, there, there are several through New Mathways, but one in particular is uh, the Quantway Statway uh, piece, which uh, we've uh, seen in a number of institutions, uh, the student success rate doubled in half the time doubled in half the time. So they're, they're making it through their credit-bearing transfer level course in half the time with twice the success rate. And uh, a, an enormous piece of that that I want to call out that's so important, and every one of you that, that teach will, will understand this, there's a piece of it called productive persistence. So it's not just being able to teach the use of numbers better. It's being able to understand your students better. It's, it's, uh, it's neuroscience. It's growth mindsets and grit. And uh, one of the very interesting, and this comes from colleagues at uh, UT Austin, one of the most interesting, there was a 15-minute intervention where students were set down in front of a computer screen and showed a very short video about how the brain is flexible, and it doesn't matter if you're 18 or you're 50, you can learn. You can still learn. And, uh, and it's, it's called it's about growth mindsets. Uh, and there was some kind of specific information. So uh, one of the most common things that students will say about mathematics is, and you tell me if you shake your head if you've heard this, I'm not a math person. I'm just not a math guy, <laughs> right? So it's not ever going to work. Yeah. Well, uh, when students are shown, uh, uh, you know, the, the science around how you can learn, and students begin in, in this productive persistence model begin to see, to say, I can learn. That alone, that 15-minute intervention. Uh, led to increased success rate. So the, the way you relate to your students, and you all know this, is, is just as powerful, or you may argue more powerful, and, and, and than the way that you teach mathematics. Right? So uh, that's one. Another is, fortunately, I, actually, uh, out in the lobby is uh, uh, something that we've uh, supported for a good while now called Ed Ready. And uh, Gary Lopez is, is here, and you can visit him out, out in the exhibit hall. Uh, but it, the uses of technology in, in sort of student interventions are, are incredibly promising. And, and one thing I should say, uh, coming from the Gates Foundation, is, uh, is just as a really important aside, 
is that it's most often assumed because of, because we worked with Bill Gates that this, that we think the solution to everything is technology. That's not true. It's, we're very explicit about that uh, on our own team. Technology for us, and the, what language I like to use is high tech is meant to create more opportunities for high touch. So if there's a way, in the case of Ed Ready, to more specifically identify where students are behind. So let's say that they have a, a less than desirable uh, math score on their ACT. How might you use technology to figure out maybe they just don't understand factoring trinomials or you know or something you know you know so maybe they don't need the whole entire course and so there's a bit of uh, there's a way to break that down to provide more personalized experience and in doing so there's more touch time there's more time that you can spend with students to understand them as individuals more and what other supports they may need and there are a lot of details about it ready that you can uh, drop by and, and see Gary out in the exhibit hall. Uh, the Texas legislature is in session right now, and uh, I know that TACC was uh, working very hard getting ready for the session, as was TCCPA. Uh, Educate Texas has spent a lot of time uh, uh, researching the issues, um, figuring out what the priorities need to be, and building consensus uh, across a wide range of, of uh, constituencies um, going into the session. Um, do you see, Melissa, some things that uh, have great promise as priorities that y'all have set at policy levels that you think can uh, have an impact on these issues? Sure. So one of the priorities of the council that we've worked very closely with many of our partners on this stage are on is transfer. Um, and it's something that we talked a lot about uh, prior to this discussion. You know, for so many of our students, and, and not every student um, has the desire to go on to a university, but for those that do, it's really important that we provide better clarity for them um, and better, better advising and better understanding of what it means to take a sequence of courses at a community college and what that's going to mean once they transfer on to the university. Um, as we were talking about, you know, if you're in particularly one of our urban areas, we often think about these things from the perspective of the university looking back, as if every student knows that if I start at Lone Star then in, in one um, major that I'm going to go on to U of H in a specific major in a specific college in a specific university and that's often not the case. They don't know if they're going to get into U of H downtown or if they're going to get into Sam Houston and even once they're in that university what college they're going to get into much less what major and all of those have different and distinct articulation agreements and we're putting a very challenging landscape in front of our students and our advisors and, and our faculty quite frankly. Um, and so to the extent that we can help provide better clarity through things like common course numbering and articulation agreements, um, particularly as we think about it at a regional level, we've done research um, that shows that not, you know, not every student, but about 70% of our students stay in region for higher ed. So even if we can be thinking about these things at a regional level and helping our students have better clarity about those pathways, that will go a long way to help our students be successful. It's one example. I think that really underscores also something that I know as, as faculty when I talk with our members, when we talk about student success, they're talking, as David said, that the reality is in their classroom. Um, but it's important, I think, to keep in mind that we are operating in a, in a wider context, that the articulation agreements, um, the transfer issues in Texas are things that individual faculty members can't really control, but they have a big impact on their students and also the value of your classes. Um, if your course is going to be accepted at Texas A&M or at Texas State, uh, your student is going to know going in that, they, that there's value attached to that that will convey to the next institution they attend. And so understanding this wider context uh, can be a powerful part of understanding your role as a faculty member um, and having a voice in that. And I've appreciated y'all's awareness of the importance of faculty being in on these discussions. Uh, because you need the faculty to, to weigh in on this and say, here's some things to look out for, or uh, we, you know, we especially would like to see this included. And that's, I think that's been an essential part of y'all's work. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's both the faculty perspective, knowing your content, knowing, um, knowing what your area of expertise is, but also being the front line with the students and understanding in a very real and day-to-day -day way the student experience and what that looks like for them. Richard, if yes. I may follow up, you, you mentioned my comments about the teacher and the student interaction. Um, 
recent, a recent study I read said that 30% of a, of a college student's um, success in college had to do with the, class, with the school and the teacher. Now, the researchers citing that cited it uh, in surprise that it was said, hey, it's not as much as you might think. I think 30% is an amazing amount of influence for teachers. It's the school and the teacher together. 30% uh, of their experience is influenced by us directly. Um, I think that's a remarkable thing. Um, I began at a community college. I went to Brazosport College because it was there. My, student, my friends were going there. And um, I remember the influence of an individual teacher who gave me, sort of like your son going to class, the aha moment of where I said, you know, if I read the material, if I'd read the chapters, I'd know what he's talking about. Today. I mean, it's a little, but that was my turnaround moment. This is a man I respected and I wanted to do well for him. So the, the power of the individual contact, the influence of, of a powerful personality that is an effective teacher, I think is a remarkable thing. And I think we heard that last night. If, if you were at the general session last night, I think you heard um, the, the last question that was asked was of a brand new faculty member who just, I believe, started teaching this semester. And she said, what advice would you give? And it was what you just said. It was the, that impact that you can have on your student. Love your discipline, love your student. Um, understand the impact you have and the value of that. Um, I, I wonder if we could step back and, and expand this just one level. Uh, as, as people who, who teach, um, where do you interact with the, the context around you in your classroom? Um, how do you draw on the resources of the institution? Are there people that you can bring in to help a student who's struggling with something? How do you keep from being stuck on an island where it's all on you and, and it's, you're having to operate, you feel like you're having to operate in isolation? You want to go to the story? I mean, I do want to piggyback on what Paul has said earlier about the growth mindset and the concept of grit. And I hope you're all familiar with the work of Carol Dweck from Stanford University, who wrote the book Mindset, The New Psychology of Success, uh, back in 2006. And then Angela Duckworth, who is best known by, I think, originally known for her TED Talk on grit. So if you want to just have in a, in a nutshell what this is about, Check the, the website Mindset Online, not Mindset Online, but MindsetOnline.com. That's Dr. Dweck's website. And then go to the TED Talk to listen to Angela Duckworth talk about grit. Also, we have uh, Paul Stokes with us. We did have Paul Stokes here. And uh, he has authored a book on grit, and he's doing sessions today. So if you want to find out more, you can go to his session. But I think that changes lives lives of students and faculty. Faculty who are incorporating this, it's more of a pedagogy, I think, or a framework for approaching your discipline, whatever your discipline is. And it revolutionizes the way you teach, and it changes the way your students react and the way they assess themselves. It's a big part of metacognition, becoming more aware of their thinking process, and uh, developing with that. The, the brain research. It's so strongly related to the brain research. Uh, I teach learning frameworks at my institution, and in that class, we do utilize all the resources. We have counselors come in and talk about career decisions and how important it is to make that appointment to have a degree plan. Uh, we have people uh, from other aspects of uh, student affairs come in and talk about access to tutoring, why they are using tutoring or why they're not using tutoring. We have people that come in and talk about uh, how important it is to be in touch with your professor. And that learning frameworks course that Dr. Head talked about is something that I think every institution should require of all students. And it's interesting that at my institution, when we were doing focus groups for our QEP, every student, faculty, uh, student and faculty focus group said that. They said, that's what we need. And so I think that that's where you bring in all those other resources. And you have people from the community that come in and talk about how they got their start at a community college and what they're doing now. 
uh, there's just so many opportunities through that avenue of the Learning Framework course. Richard asked other services that I use to help. How'd you say, feel like I'm not on an island doing that? I'll call in everybody in my class. Have the librarians come in. The librarians, librarians are some of the most talented people at your institution in terms of technology for sure, but they don't kind of stuff. Uh, so they're very useful. And, and part of with the students, um, once they find where the library is, is, is not being afraid to, is, is put a human face on the librarian. Go, here's one of them, go talk to them. You know, they're not good at biking. And they have all kinds of information. They can provide all kinds of help with research and all kinds of other things. So have the librarians come in, uh, tutor uh, the labs from the tutor come in and introduce what they what they are able to offer. And of course, I send students to the tutoring lab. Uh, sometimes I recommend, sometimes I say, you have to go to the tutoring lab. Um, I'll bring in, um, so uh, I have occasional brought in advisors to talk about certain things uh, briefly, uh, but I'll also bring in representatives of the honors program um, and teachers who are about to do a study abroad program in the summer. So it's not just for more remedial help. Uh, we do have supplemental instruction too, as a lot of you probably do. Um, I've had marginal, unpredictable success with that, but we do have that as a resource. But. You may not think those students in your class aren't doing so hot would be eligible for the honors program. But teaching English, I have to remind myself that for some of those students, I'm seeing them at their worst. They're the stars in the other groups. You know, in their chemistry and their biology and their math, they're the best students. So honors program is not out of reach for some of them. And you would think, well, they're not interested in going to England, take a British lit course. They do sometimes. And so both, both ends of the, there are a lot of services we can offer that I'll try to uh, introduce them to. Thank you. And, and I think that's important, just as we're talking about mindset, uh, if the faculty mindset is, uh, I'm doing this solo, um, it, it can be overwhelming. But if you see yourself as part of, of a team, of a wider infrastructure that, uh, that you can draw on for support, um, that, that can be a very powerful awareness. Steve, I wanted to ask you, you're coming at it from a different uh, point of view. Right. How do you see that, uh, that interaction and the, the looking at it more from a, a team perspective? Yeah, let me, let me just back up just for a minute. When we talk about policy issues, I, I think that uh, most progressive administrators know it's not just the faculty in your classroom. There are other factors. For example, um, if students are coming to you not prepared, Really, if you want to go back to some federal policies that were changed many years ago, or well, about 10 years ago, when uh, some of the Head Start money was eliminated, and so and some of the pre-kindergarten activities were eliminated. In our system, for example, in our service area, upwards of 50% of the students that start in kindergarten are not ready for kindergarten. They can't read and write and know ABCs. And so by the time they're in the fifth grade, they read at the second grade level. And when they're in the ninth grade, they're reading at sixth grade. And when they graduate, Ninth, so there's some federal policy issues there. There's also, uh, it may not mean anything to you, but continuous Pell, you know, the uh, summer Pell was eliminated. So we're trying to get some of that restored, and that, that will help you in the long term, I think. If students are continuously enrolled and not let them go off and whatever it is they do, I mean, I'm a parent, so I, I know what they do. I did it myself. So anyway, uh, there are, it, it's a broad issue. It's not. It's, it's what the Gates Foundation is doing, it's what the Kresge Foundation is doing, what we're trying to do, it's what the state's doing, it's what the federal government is doing. You know, uh, locally, at least for us, I, I just think it's important that faculty and administrators and staff be in, in those discussions. That's the key to this. This is not an administrative decision. It can't be. And there's some people out in the audience that worked through this with us, and we had starts and stop over this, but it's very important, I think, if you're going to make progress, that you're working on this together. It's in a non-threatening atmosphere. It is, you just have to try things. And some of the people out here know we dealt with the English department. We were just trying. That's all we're looking for. Get away from the grade issue. That has to, to me, that has to be off the table. Now, you can talk about overall success rates, but I'm talking about individuals and worrying about how they're doing in the classroom. That That's no good because I uh, I taught. I can tell me where you want me to be in, uh, in the curve and I'll be there. I can give five A's and five B's and five C's and D's and F's. 
And I've done that before, by the way, when I was threatened uh, with my job earlier. I, I, that, so I think it's important that you, as you're looking at your own institution, that you taught, you engage the leadership as a faculty and tell them you need to be a part of those discussions and be a part of those decisions. I, I We're working with some other colleges, Lone Star is working with other colleges, and what I told their presidents is this needs to be a faculty-driven uh, you can call it an initiative or a program or whatever it is you want to do, but the faculty need to be, and they, they pretty much need to be leading it. Thank you for, for pointing that out, because I, I find in, in my conversations with people, as complicated as the policy issues are, what makes this most difficult, probably, is that it comes down to trust. That a faculty member needs to know that their input is welcome, uh, that it's valued, that they're safe. Uh, to participate. Um, Can I and add, let me just add one thing, though. I, I think you know this goes both ways. The faculty you have to know that they uh, you need faculty spokespeople who can come in and just have the courage to go tell the president or the chancellor that, uh, like people out in this audience, that hey, that's not going to work. And it's not a personal deal. You just have to speak up, though, because if you don't say anything, people like me just keep plowing ahead. I think because you didn't say anything, it must be a good idea. And. Uh, which leads to problems at home and with my own children sometimes. But, you know, you have to speak up and get yourself in those meetings and say your mind. So. And that's, that's a challenge um, that's more welcome at some institutions than others. Um, but you're right. It, and well, did, I, did I say something? Uh, and but, it, but it's true. And that, the grade distribution, um, just saying, I, I think you're wrong. Uh, faculty sometimes have a reputation for being um, just obstructing change. Often, I find they're just asking hard questions or pointing out the things about it that make it hard. Um, and that's a valuable contribution. You do want to come with constructive ideas. Here's something we can do. But it's important before you step on a landmine to, for somebody to point that out. And I just wanted to add, I think that goes beyond the institutional context, too. I think, you know, from the policy perspective, I mean, we make better policy decisions when more voices are represented. When the student voice is represented, when the faculty voice is represented, um, better decisions are made. If, if I might add, I mean, you guys are here, so you're involved to some degree. But we all know a lot of colleagues who are never, they're, they may be unhappy, they may complain. But they're never involved, they never participate. Uh, whether it's professional conferences or the fact of the Senate or attending board meetings or as uh, Dr. Hibb was talking about, simply going up to the administrator and say, you know, I want to talk to you about this idea, it's not a good one. Um, so, you know, faculty are sometimes um, stubborn in their insistence that they're not going to be involved in those things. I think that's too bad. Um, and if it's true, and I think it is, that you need the greatest number of people to participate to assure, to, to maximize the chances of, of a program, say, being, uh, being good, we need as many of us to have our voices heard as possible. Um, questions or, or thoughts that, that are occurring to you um, as you hear this. Um, some of these may be things you haven't heard before. Maybe you've heard all this before. But I'd, I'd like to open it up. Um, I'll bring the microphone around. Um, but uh, what are your thoughts? Yes. And this is something I think is hard to, to put in policy terms. How, how do you, you're not going to introduce a bill about that, but faculty know you get a huge impact from these things that are, that are hard to put on some people's radar. Um, any thoughts on that? Do you all, is, is that something 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think that is difficult at a policy level. Um, when you're dealing with a legislature that meets only every other year and for an intense 140 days, it's difficult. But I think it's incumbent upon all of us to be at that table. I'm interested in the conversation about having faculty feeling like it's it's their place and it's, it's safe to come in and tell administration that this isn't going to work. I tell all of my presidents the same thing to tell legislators. Um, you've got to be at the table, you've got to be there and say why this isn't a good policy or why it is a good policy. Um, the other thing I'd stress too is, you know, you've got to be able to bring data to the table. But data is fact, data is not truth. And in many instances, I think legislators are better they have a better understanding of policy issues when you can give them some sense of a narrative construct about what it means. Um, they're confronted in daily life with data washing over them. They need to have the faculty member, an administrator, or a student come tell them what does that really mean in the life of that person, in the, the betterment of that community. We have a question back here. Hi. I think we all know that there are a lot of changes in technology for the classroom. And one that has recently come to an issue where I teach is the distance learning. Originally, I believe distance learning was set up to increase enrollment in normally low enrollment classrooms. So you could broadcast to different maybe sites. But now, I don't know if it's a trend across all schools or just some schools to go ahead and use distance learning as a way to maybe save money, pay one instructor to teach. 60 or more students as opposed to just 25 or so. And I don't know if there's any data or research in terms of whether distance learning students do just as well, better or poorly, when they are in a classroom at a site that has basically a full class. Well, I, let me answer that from Lone Star. They do not do as well as face-to-face uh, -face students. We actually have another committee that's being driven by faculty also to make recommendations. And uh, we've been looking at different models. We have 25,000 students at Lone Star that are taking a class. About Only about 20% of those are online only. So what they're doing is supplementing their schedules. And, and I th that's been the trend for a number of years. I, I never thought of it as saving money that way. It doesn't, it, that's not the way we're looking at it. And I mean, if, if you look at it strictly from a business standpoint, I suppose so. That's, but the way it's being used, again, is to supplement schedules. Now, what we're taking a look at right now is um, do we want to make some of those workloads full time? And that's, that's a recommendation. I don't, is anybody out there on that committee? None of you all are. And uh, I think that's the recommendation coming forward is that we have a, a group of uh, dedicated distance learning faculty. And that's, that's a that's a different issue. Maybe next year I'll come back and talk to you about where we are with that. But um, I, I, I just think it's a valuable part of what we do. And I mean, we're t we're t we've taken a look at the WGU model. We've seen what Dallas has done and Miami-Dade and uh, Broward and what they've done out at Maricopa. You know, it, it is for some students and it's not for some students. I think for faculty it's just as much work as it was, if, if not more, than in the regular classroom. So when you're talking about text messages and emails, and I know I've taught online and it's a, it's a full-time job, yeah. So. That, that I think also raises an important issue about uh, with outcomes-based funding, we've got uh, colleges being assessed on outcomes. When we have all different kinds of students, different kinds of experience, different kinds of educational delivery, um, and yeah. can we just take one number and say, okay, your your passing rate is X, when there's so much more going on? Well, let me number. let me just give you one quick administrative view of this. And um, if I had to list our five priorities, okay, I'm going to put student success in that five. But if we don't have the finances, we can't do anything. I mean, one of the successes of Lone Star and Doubt wherever you're from, you have to have money to do things. And so the way you get money in our state is you enroll students. And so distance learning is a way, it is a way to enroll students. So is dual credit. So you may not like any of those things, and you like exactly the way they're operating. And so I think the challenge for us is to take a look at dual credit and distance learning and work on them and work with people like David and Gail and go, okay, what should we be doing? better about that because it is part of our financial model. It is a critical part. A student in distance learning counts just as much as a student face-to-face. -face. That's just the reality of it. So, 
We have a question over here. Along the lines of um, like success in for the high school gate preparing them for us, we saw that we had the four by four rule, and then as soon as those students getting ready to graduate, they changed it before they had a chance to see the results. Right now, we're getting the four by fours, and we saw our developmental needs dropping. These kids are getting out of high school after having four by four and able to go into college out there. And that I know, in, you know, actually, I guess it's three years now, that's going to change again because we had something that was successful and we got rid of it. So, I mean, well, we're just not looking or waiting to see if it works. It's before this we guy's it. fault right here, so I'm going to let him answer that. <laughs> you know, I. I think there's, there is a sentiment in the legislature to try to smooth that out as much as possible. And I will tell you with the passage of HB5 last time, most of the policymakers I talked to, and I'm sure Melissa hears the same thing, they don't want any significant changes to the changes they made last time other than tweaks. And that is a way to try to have this policy move forward and see what are the outcomes post HB5 changes. Um, I don't know if you're sensing the same thing. Well, and I just wanted to add, so um, one of the things that we're focused on is how do we better connect community colleges with their local high school partners to make House Bill 5 be successful? How do you ensure that those endorsements are meaningful, that they're aligned to the programs and fields of study offered at their local community colleges? Um, how are we thinking about connecting high school counselors with college advisors so that students understand, students and families understand the choices that they're making to the extent that there's clarity. Um, so that's some of the things that we're focused on, not from a, the perspective of changing the direction of House Bill 5, and I think, you know, you share very valid concerns that, that we organizationally would echo, and I think from our perspective, the challenge before us now is to um, take the endorsements under House Bill 5 and make them as meaningful and robust and rigorous as possible so that they provide opportunities for students beyond high school. I would loop back just real quickly. I mean, Richard, you mentioned, you know, essentially outcomes-based funding. Um, you know, last session, um, the outcomes-based funding student success points was, was put in place. Um, one of the notions behind student success points is to measure a student's progress through the community college, whether that's completion of the first dev ed sequence, first 15 hours, all the way through graduation transfer. Um, I, I think the notion is just that, how can we recognize and how can we drive institutional decisions towards student success? And we talked about it earlier to some extent, allowing your, your boards and your administration to be able to make some hard decisions on student success with faculty helping them make those hard decisions because now there's funding tied to it. I, I think, and this is just a personal comment, but the outcomes-based funding agenda took a number of sessions before it, it passed the Texas legislature. And we were very involved in that and, and pushed very hard against it for, for a long, long time. The issue has matured in, during that time, and I think we, we know a lot more than we did when, when the issue first came up. And one thing I'm finding is that much of what policymakers are seeing is going to have an impact really isn't about what happens in the classroom. It's about the transfer and articulation and other obstacles uh, that students run into before they even walk through your door. And if we lose students for these kind of ridiculous reasons uh, that have nothing to do with academic performance, um, then that, that's where a lot of the focus is. Um, and I think that's something that, that uh, faculty can be very supportive of. Uh, Dan, you had a question.
Thank you, Dan. That that's uh, in fact the fact that you don't know them is is the reason they're here. I, I I think the motivation for having this discussion is that there are a lot of people working on issues that have a direct impact on what you do uh, that you don't know or you don't know what they're talking about. They often have a vocabulary that's different from faculty, and so this is an introduction. It's a way of of uh, welcoming a conversation among people from different points of view. And, uh, yeah, yeah Dan, I, pardon me, Richard. Dan, I'm glad they're here. They know stuff I don't know. They have perspectives I don't have. They have um, um, sources of money I don't have that the rest of us don't <laughs> have. Um, but, it's, but it's important. It's important because if we're talking about student success, I'm talking about teacherly stuff. I choose, for example, not to teach online. I've never done it. It simply doesn't appeal to me. I didn't become a teacher not to walk in the room and see them face to face. I can tease with them and make fun of them and sing songs to them. So I don't do online stuff. But they know about online stuff from a whole different perspective. So I do think, in fact, student success is important at all levels and even outside the college. So I think they do have things to say about it. And uh, as I say, I, they, uh, they know a lot of stuff that we may not know. It's, it's probably worth noting, we work on different groups together also. We're on the Student Success Council and uh, the, you know, it helps people like me to come in and talk to a faculty so I can see what your issues are. Now I do this at the college anyway, but, and I've been involved with student success, but there are so many other issues, there are policies being set that, and when I mentioned that student success is just beyond the faculty, there are other issues that go, go that contribute to student success. Let me just give one example that uh, we've been dealing with. We're trying to simplify the federal financial aid application. It's ridiculously long and complicated, and uh, that will make a difference. When we look at barriers for student success, it's not just in the classroom, and I've, I've, got, the, I've got that piece of it. Matter of fact, one of our, uh, one of our uh, associate vice chancellors told me that she estimated that students spend about 90% of their time on campus in the classroom. So with their experience. So I've, I've got what's important. But for people like me, administratively, we need to know what these other issues are so that we can make life better for these students and provide them uh, child care and help the reduce loans and make the financial aid application simpler so that we remove all these other barriers or try to, try to lower those barriers. So to me, that's why we all need to be talking together all the time. I have... Uh two comments, and I'm not sure I have either one of them actually fully formulated in my mind. Um, and they're not necessarily a question as much as they are comments. One is um, student uh, success would imply the existence of a goal. And I'm wondering if some of the difficulties in students achieving success is that they're being asked to set their goals before they actually have a broad uh, perspective of what those goals could be. In other words, to ask a senior in high school or a freshman in college to set a goal for their life career, it may be a little bit too soon. I think, in my mind, I would like to see the two-year schools to remain as broad as possible within a increasingly speedy narrowing of their goals as they reach the junior and senior years. It's just kind of the way I view it. Instead of trying to ask a junior in high school to decide what they're going to do for the rest of their duration here on Earth, um, the other observation is, in some cases, um, I'm in science, I teach biology, and so I understand the value of measurements, but I also know that we can only measure the things that are observable and measurable. And yet, much of what we do in education is very organic, and it's very much, a, uh, you're in the, the milieu of humanity when you're trying to mentor and, and foster some of the students. And I see a lot of students who are, um, measured almost to the point of paralysis, this, this idea about analysis to paralysis. And I think in some cases students have been measured so continuously that they're so busy jumping through the hoops and achieving the measurement and uh, passing the placement exam so that they can pursue their uh, major to achieve their income and their careers that they forget to appreciate and to enjoy the enlightenment of education along the way. And it's become simply a measurement process and then a credentialing process as opposed to an educating process. Just a concern on my part. 
Thank you, and, and I think that's an important point. And Bill, let me let me tell you one thing that from the pressure from the, and I'm just speaking from the administrative standpoint. If you'll take a look at the legislature and look who's in the legislature, and the amount of money which is for community colleges is around two billion dollars per biennium, two billion dollars per uh, biennium. So, j just walk your way through there and see who they are and what they represent. So they're looking for some return on their dollar. They they're looking at this in a different way than than you are or even I would. And I'm a liberal arts guy. I went to a community college. My, my doctorate's in history, so I, I, if you can figure out how to measure history, more power to you. But uh, um, but that's what we're dealing with. That's just the realities. And then Steve knows they want to see results. And there's a lot of pressure on the legislature. I mean, look, who's, look who the leadership is right now. They're, they're into efficiencies. They want to see data. They want to see results. Where you can help, and I think with groups like this, is going, okay, we can do this, but we can't do that. And this makes some sense, and that doesn't make sense. That's where groups like TCCTA come, come in to help uh, moderate those behaviors, and TAC does that also. So. I think that's very important because the faculty can come in and protect the students sometimes from this, uh, all the analysis and the, the, the data that could really crush the, the, the heart of what we're doing. At the same same time, recognizing the reality of the political environment we're working in, and there's a, there's a point to be made. I mean, we we could spend all our time doing things that that never get anywhere, and so having someone say, "What are we getting out of this?" is a valid question. And well, the, the legislature will listen, but it's got to be it has to be uh, really not emotional. It's got to be fact driven. It's got to be somebody like David or Gail coming in and going, "Okay, let's let's just talk about the realities of this." and we, we run into things uh, often where we, we have people say, we want to get students in and out just as fast as we can. Uh, and no wasted credits and all that. And sometimes they need to take a class and have that exploration. And when you're talking with someone on a budget committee on, on Senate Finance or House Appropriations, they're looking at columns of numbers. And a whole lot of things start to make sense until you say, well, did you do that? Um, do you have kids? Do you want that for them? And then it becomes personal. And then it's not just the columns of numbers anymore. And I think faculty probably tell that story. Yeah, before uh, we assembled for the meeting, we were all talking. And <clears throat> we were talking about, on the one hand, students don't do well with options. I understand what you're saying. Um, on the other hand, we can be too restrictive and even punitive about counting the number of hours. You can't take, you take this course more than twice. We're going to charge you. We're going to charge them. You can't drop more than six classes. You better, better make good decisions. You can't exceed 120 hours. You can't exceed 60 hours in, in the community college. So we can, we can be so particular about the numbers in an attempt, and all sincerity, a sincere attempt to um, get them through efficiently, which is to their advantage, too, that we sacrifice what college is all about, or part of it. You know, self exploration, self discovery, and we give them no chance to, um, once they do see what college can offer, we give them far too little chance to then explore those new things. So clearly, we can't set them adrift in the ocean with no guidance, but we can overdo the uh, restrictions too. What are we, the, the line between hyper efficiency and aimless wandering is, is what we're, is what so we're aiming for? We have time for just a couple more questions. I am just uh, wanted to confirm and correct. Uh, there's 50% of the folks there on the panel that are instructors. Dr. Head was my instructor, and he um, was part of my doctoral program. And by the way, I'm defending on Tuesday, so wish me luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he gave me a side that I've never really truly appreciated before, which was the finance side which I've gone uh, over and beyond in that regard. It opened my eyes in a whole area where i had been very restricted with regards to my involvement with students and my past experience being a counselor and then teaching psychology. So I just wanted to set the record straight. We have half the panel up there that are instructors. And also just uh, a follow through on my dissertation. The accountability, I think you have to look at, you know, we need to be accountable, but the government, parents, students are all going to have different measures 
of success. So we have to be sensitive to that. Um, other question? We have a question over here. I actually don't have a question. I have a couple of comments. One, I wanted to, um, I went to McLennan Community College. I graduated from there. Now I teach there. Um, I got my bachelor's through Tarleton, and I'm getting my master's through Angelo State University. So I wanted to quickly um, direct a comment to the question about distance learning. I know it's not at a community college level, but um, that is, it is the only college in Texas that has a master's program online for applied psychology. And I would say definitely that um, I would agree that the level of success coming out of that is probably not very um, high. And I think from my own personal experience of being in it, a lot of that is attributed to the level of um, participation from the instructor on the other side. You are basically in this program and you're getting no feedback and there's a, you're, um, maybe they have high volumes of people that they're teaching. but. So if at a community level people are doing that, my recommendation would be to please have constant communication with the student because you're out there, you have no clue what's going on. Um, second comment I wanted to direct to Gail, is it? Um, again, in our program, um, we are doing a professional development series called Teaching for Learning. It is for um, CEU credits. Um, with different faculty members, anybody that's interested in doing it. And one of the most profound books that we have done so far is Mindset. I want to commend you for bringing that book up. And one thing I've learned through all of the teaching is that outside reading is just as important as your textbook, if not more important. Um, I would highly encourage everybody in this room to read that book. It made a profound impact on me in the way that I see things, and so much so in our department that we're trying to um, see if we can make it a mandatory class for English um, students. It's an amazing book, and so I just wanted to thank you very much for thank bringing it up. Thank you for sharing that. That issue of mindset and uh, resilience keeps coming up. I, I do want to point out at 4 o'clock we have a session on uh, resilience, uh, if, if you're interested in knowing more about that. We've been very interested in it, uh, specifically because of student success. How do we increase student completion rates? We need to get better at what we do, but if the whole point is to eliminate every obstacle to the student, we'll have a generation of students who never know how to deal with an obstacle. So how do we build that capacity in our students uh, is an important part of this. I think we have time. I'm, the questions are growing. Carol was next, and I, we may be close to out of time. Quick point of, a quick point of clarification. Uh, as you all know, uh, community colleges cannot offer master's degrees programs. Uh, that's coming through our university center, and those classes are the responsibility, and those instructors work for the universities, not for McLennan. Thank you. Okay. Um, we had a question. She had had her hand up for a little while. Thank you. I'll make it fast. Um, I understand. I believe I heard. Paul, you, you work for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I think you said you were a former teacher. Was that was I, that you taught at one point? Yeah, I was a faculty member for nine years and uh, also an academic program director, and I chaired our faculty senate. So, okay, so I four identify very well with you. you and I, and the, the other, so, that, I mean, that's remarkable, and I'm thankful for that. And I, I was curious to know, on the, on the foundation, um, are you viewed or are your insights um, really taken to heart by those on that foundation who have not taught? And how has your experience as a teacher uh, come into play? And does it come into play on a regular basis in what you do in shaping the uh, structure, I guess, and purpose of the foundation? Okay, that, That's a wonderful question. Thank you. It, uh, and I'm going to be really honest. It feels, it feels weird to say I'm going to be very honest and transparent <laughs> in front of a whole, whole crowd. And maybe this is recorded. We'll see. Uh, but uh, uh, it's no secret that as the as our foundation was formed, our, the, the the higher education work began as a special initiative. So it, it it never it never began as an explicit dive into higher ed. So for that reason, our our early leadership and program officer staff, none of them were actually from higher education. So as the program began to shore up, uh, 
you know, we, we're pretty clear it was gonna, it's going to be a part of the foundation. Our investments in higher education are only going to grow. Then, uh, the, quite honestly, the, the, the leadership, the foundation, and the higher ed work has just quite honestly matured. And so uh, I was, part of the reason I was hired was because I was a faculty member. And I'd had a, uh, experience. And I was, a, you know, I was also a, an academic affairs administrator at one point in my career. So it, um, uh, it, it, that was valued. It was, uh, uh, was brought to the team for that reason. And uh, we have not had any kind of explicit faculty engagement uh, initiative. Uh, we now want to. And, and, and I hope very soon I'm going to be, after this, after this session ends, actually have further conversations with Richard about, Texas is a, uh, is a special, <laughs> special place. And, uh, and, and uh, for, well, in, in a good way. In a good yeah. way. I mean, uh, I'm, in, I'm quite, quite impressed, you know, uh, quite impressed actually by, you know, you, by your very nature or sort of decentralized, but you're, but you have I mean, Educate Texas and I can, you know, and, and I mean, in this fantastic, very large organization uh, doing very important work. So I'm actually quite interested in working with, with Richard and, and as many as you as, as, as possible to figure out, you know, what, what are models for proper student, or, or, sorry, proper faculty engagement? I mean, ha, what are ways that we can build into our funding? And, you know, I, I have to tell you, one of the things I said as we were thinking about a faculty engagement initiative was, I said, don't do just a faculty in, engagement you know, initiative because nothing is more suspect than the Gates Foundation showing up to say, we're here to engage you. Uh, but rather, you know, how can, how can this become an essential piece of, of all of the work that we're trying to do? And we're, and we're trying to figure that out, but we're very sincere a, a, about that. And, uh, and, I, and I really mean that as someone who understands this world. Uh, I see very positive steps in that direction. We are running uh, close on time, but I wanted to take just a moment here at the end um, that I, I find in, in my conversations uh, with y'all when we talk about student success, well, there's, there's a, a contrast I see. Uh, when you talk with, with, with legislators often, uh, student success means completion rates and numbers and all that. When I talk with faculty, they start naming names. And they say, well, let me tell you about my students. And they have a story. And uh, it, is, it is profound and personal and, and visceral. Um, but I find that also uh, with people who may not direct uh, directly engage students uh, in their work. And I'd like to give you all just an opportunity, if you'd like. Um, what makes this personal for you? Why do you care about this? Why does this matter? Um, uh, if, if you have any thoughts on that or would like to share, I'd like to give you all a chance for that. Well, I went to a community college myself. All four of my children went to a community college, and they're all successful. So when I look at that, I look at, uh, I mean, we have students with disabilities, we have veterans, we have, uh, we've really been focused on workforce, but we know what's happening to our students in the workforce. They're going out and uh, getting good jobs, they have nice lives. We are constantly uh, getting notes back from our former students telling us uh, how much they appreciated what was done by a faculty member or a staff or somebody did something good at the college that made a difference in their lives, including things like going to class. I mean, it just you could do better than that, and uh, which is what happened to me. So you know, these are personal. These are personal issues. That's why we do this. When I started off with the social justice and equality issue, it's about giving people opportunities to be successful. That's that's your job. That's my job. That's everybody's job uh, associated with a community college. So that's really what student success is. It's about individuals and making a difference. Um, I would just like to add, just so we get it all completely clear, one more. I've been adjunct faculty for 10 years. Um, so um, I, it's personal for me. Um, if it wasn't for Austin Community College, I wouldn't be here today. Like Steve's son, I went to UT. Well, he went straight to community college. I went to UT first and decided I had better places to be than in class. Um, I went back two years later and went to Austin Community College, and that led me on to Concordia University, where I graduated summa cum laude. So if it wasn't for Austin Community College, I wouldn't be here today. Um, I teach, taught for 10 years, but more importantly, every day when I go home, I get to talk to my wife, who's a counselor at the Riverside campus at Austin Community College. And she puts people 
in the classes who need child care, who need health care. She's a social worker by training. So it's personal for me. I mean, that's why I do it. I could have lobbied for a lot of different other organizations in my career, but I chose this one particularly. So the two uh, very quick things for me is one, if you may hear it in my accent, I'm a fifth generation rural Kentucky dairy farmer. And so that's where I began. I didn't know, you know I knew a few people went to college, but, but very few that actually left the small town I grew up in. Uh, I'm the only person I knew that went it, it received an advanced degree. Uh, so, it, so the, the students I have always, with, with with one exception, that's my second bit that I've taught, have always been like me, <laughs> you know. And so I'm very quite uh, that um, that's just a huge part of who I am. Uh, the second thing is for the exception was for two years I was pulled out of the program I was in uh, to create a core curriculum for an honors college. And I taught exclusively honor students for two years. And one would think that this, you know, this must be the dream, right? It, it, the, the most well-prepared, uh, you know, this is the, quote, cream of the crop, uh, best and brightest. Well, the, the truth is a remarkable number of these students were not prepared for college. <laughs> they didn't, you know, they didn't know how to write well. Uh, they, you know, had all kinds of challenges. But what we did with them is we made it impossible for them to fail. Because this very small group of students, we wrapped every conceivable uh, support service around them, and which only represented, you know, what, one or one percent or so of the institution I was part of. And so it just, it, that stuck with me. And, and I'm, again, sort of a moment of transparency. I actually developed a little bit of a resentment uh, for that, those kinds of programs because, because I wanted to know why was that not good enough for all the rest of the students. Right, so um, uh, so that's I sort of made my mind up at that point. That's the last time I'm going to be doing that, and and just spend my time thinking about how we are providing what we can provide for more students in more places. So I am the lone member of the panel who is not a faculty member. I apologize. I will, I will get on that. <laughs> I should have just made something up. Um, but it's personal for me, too. Um, I was very fortunate and realized I was very fortunate to have an amazing high school guidance counselor um, who went above and beyond for me to find ways for me to be engaged in a high school where I felt like I didn't belong. Um, and she has a lot to do with why I am passionate about education, why I believe in education, why I believe in the promise of education. And so for me, it's about a social and moral and economic imperative to make sure that every student has somebody who believes in them. And every student has the opportunities that I know that I was fortunate to have. Well, thank you all so much for what you do. Um, I, I, I think what we hear in all this is that it, it takes all of us. This isn't something we fix one piece and we've solved the problem. That's a multifaceted thing, and we have to do it together. Um, so thank you all for being here. I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, and enjoy the rest of the conference. I do have one announcement. There will be a test later today about the elevators in the hotel. So, so study for that and enjoy the rest of the convention. Thank you. <laughs>